if you look big organizations, I mean today we're sitting in, in RMB, all right, and RMB can get out to their customers in so many different ways, but a small startup can utilize and harness technology in similar ways, obviously not on the scale, but they can utilize technology, and we've seen that many, many times. So if you don't adapt and if you are not adapting to the new business paradigm fast enough and being innovative, it will be very hard for your organization to survive. And by way of, of an example, sorry, as I said, I, I, they asked me earlier, they said, are you a walker? And I said, yes. I guess so they put like a step. There. So if I fall flat on my face, it will be funny, I know, but I'm going to try not to. Okay. Um, all right, so let's look at a, a couple of what I call digital Darwinism failures. And I've just taken a few from, from, from the last, uh, since 2000, okay, and, and kind of a couple of names which you may be surprised have gone bankrupt or gone into Chapter 11. But if you look at these, these companies that have been overtaken by... Society by Technology, uh, Life Magazine's a, a, a good name, Polaroid, um, Pontiac, Chrysler, or in fact, but we won't go there, uh, Blockbuster Video, all right, uh, American Airlines, and my personal favorite, what I think is the poster child in terms of uh, a company that didn't keep up with its market and, and its customers is Kodak, all right? So um, let's have a look at Kodak, all right? Kodak is, is more or was more than a company. I mean, Kodak defined a market. Is, is there anyone here who hasn't heard of Kodak? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, it's it's an old company. It was founded in 1880 by by George Eastman, um, and it went bankrupt. They went into Chapter 11. All right, in 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 2012, and I mean. It was so synonymous with the market. You know a product. All right, I know you saw that coming. Um, but why did Kodak go into Chapter 11? Um, well, obvious, the obvious answer is because of digital photography, okay? If you boil it down a bit further, they didn't keep up with the customer's demand, the changing demand of society, the changing demand of their market. And an interesting fact about Kodak, which not a lot of people know. Yes, everyone knows that they were overtaken by Fujifilm and a num num Canon and a number of other digital uh, photographers. But in 1976, an engineer by the name of uh, George Stassman, I think his name was, all right, pitched an idea to his bosses at Kodak. And the idea was for a photograph to be taken on a digital print, and then the consumer could decide whether or not to uh, print it out. Okay? Uh, that's just another way of saying it was a, a, a digital photograph. And his bosses at Kodak actually said, no, we think people kind of prefer the uh, chemical film industry, and they turned it down. All right, so that's an idea of the wrong technology at the wrong time and making the wrong decision. But digital Darwinism doesn't discriminate. And the triad of innovation um, in, in, in company Sharp. All right, Sharp was a defining company in the 1980s, and Japanese companies themselves were at the forefront of innovation. I think everybody agrees that and has agreed that. But, I mean, if, if you look, they even used to sponsor Manchester United, which is one of the greatest football teams in the world. Why is everybody laughing? And why are those of you who are laughing have a Liverpool accent? No. <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, but, you know, Sharp, has anyone bought a Sharp product recently? Exactly. Uh, how about Sanyo? Okay, I'm just warming this up. I'm trying. To, I'm getting bigger and bigger names. All right. Um, here's one which will surprise you: Panasonic. All right. Has anyone bought a Panasonic product of late? Sorry. Well done. You bought batteries. All right. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, at least we know they're not cooking on gas. Um, but you know, Panasonic in, 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 in the late 90s or in the 90s were, were synonymous with innovation in, in many different areas, and they're being overtaken by the likes of Samsung. 
All right, and probably the biggest one which is struggling and there. They're not in, in chapter 11, but they are struggling. There's a company called Sony, all right? Um, and everyone says, no way, Sony is struggling. Okay, who's bought a Sony product recently? One guy. Okay, two guys, there you go. Which is, which is not bad. Batteries, right? <laughs> One of the things about innovation, and I'm glad you brought that up, is, is that when you create an I'm skipping ahead of my but it's okay. When you create what I call an innovation value curve, all right, or a new way of doing something, or a new product, all right, competitors are very, very fast to catch up. And that's the thing about innovation. If you innovate and find something new, there's this thing called best practices, and everybody tries to replicate best practices, all right? And your profit margin and time in which you can exploit that innovation is diminishing as time goes on, as information becomes available, as people can reverse engineer what you've done. And of this particular talk tonight is that, yes, we can innovate, but we've got to get it towards a process, and we've got to be able to repeat that process if we want to stay ahead of the curve. All right, I have jumped ahead of it, but so if I repeat myself a bit later, <laughs> well, forgive me. So essentially, at the moment, what I am saying is not innovating is a risk. I remember about 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people used to come up, execs, and say, I have a strategy, and our strategy for this organization is to be innovative. All right? Right now, business as usual is a risk. Innovation is business as usual. If you're not innovating every day, you're not keeping pace with the rate of change that your company, your customers, the market is asking for. And that is one of the biggest risks that you can face. And it's specifically pertinent for people such as yourselves, for, for business analysts, okay? Because you are tasked with understanding both technology and business. How many times does business come to you and say, okay, this is really the two, and how I can take it to a changing market? All right, because it's no use marrying those two and taking it to a market that doesn't want it. Okay, and that is the is the biggest challenge for us as, as business analysts. As I said, for one essential task for companies is to build. forward. Okay, now that we've had a look at why we need to, to innovate, all right, um, let's just and, and, and calm down and breathe a bit deeply and say, all right, what is innovation? How do we define it? So what I've done over here is I've presented a couple of textbook definitions of what innovation is. The funny thing about anyone's under 18, I would suggest you step out for a minute, but innovation is kind of like university sex, all right? <laughs> As I was saying, <laughs> yeah, innovation's kind of like Sex at university, all right? Everyone's talking about it. Apparently, everyone's doing it. But then when you get close to people you know, no one's actually up to it, are they? All right? And that's the funny thing about innovation. It's a hot topic. I mean, I, I caught a plane on SAA the other day, and they got these little drop-down uh, uh, TV screens, and they, they print the words of what the people are saying. And there were some fashion designers talking about innovation. Then I opened the magazine, and, and, and there was some other, I think it was a holiday company talking about innovation. As I said, everyone seems to be doing it. Everyone's talking about it. But when you scratch the surface, it's like, your mates, hey, how did you go the other night? No, no not too well. You know? So 
that's what it's like. But if we look at the definition, okay, and, and I've defined innovation in the workplace as defined as the deployment of new knowledge and creative ideation to recommend new applications, services, and products to satisfy customer needs through invention and commercialization. Now, out of this, I've taken a couple of, of, of key words, all right? And the key words that we can look at is creating new knowledge, okay? Um, and for it to be innovative, it can be new. Now, in order for it to be innovative, we can add to something, we can create something totally new, or we can even subtract from something. Okay, there's an innovation process um, called, uh, it's not subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, that's what it's called. <laughs> okay, um, in order to create new applications and services, okay, and to satisfy customer needs. Now, that is very important for me because most people think of innovation in terms of external customers. All right, now many of you work inside organizations and you have what are known as internal customers. All right, so innovation can affect both external customers and you can add value to your internal customers. And that must never ever be lost. All right, um, the next point about this is commercialization. All right, if we can't take a new invention or a new idea and commercialize it, then that's not innovation, that's an invention. All right, but it's not innovation, because by definition, innovation leads to commercialization. So it's how do we how do we get a return on investment out of it? Um, another view is that innovation links the design, development, and implementation of new or altered products, services, and processes within business frameworks to create future value. And the reason I've put that in is because of the fact that it's not a thought fox, it's not a will of the wisp idea that is a once-off and can be captured. I specifically use the words design, development, and implementation, as well as business frameworks, all right? We have within us the ability to say, this is how we came up with this idea. This is how we stimulated this idea. This is how we took the idea to the market and commercialized it, and this is how we got a return on investment. So by definition, that means that we can turn it into a process. And that is what we all should be looking towards doing with innovation. It's, it's, it's not a once-off, all right? It's to be able to capture it and then frame it against the business frameworks to ultimately create value. So yes, when you're asked about this talk and they say, well, what is innovation? You can say it's similar to university sex, or you could say that, whichever one you prefer. <laughs> I know which one you guys prefer. <laughs> All right, areas of innovation. So once we, once we have an idea of what innovation is, we look at various areas, specifically within our organization, okay? And remember, once again, I'm aiming at both external and internal customers, okay? And the areas of innovation, um, I've, I've kind of filtered down to, to three areas. And the first one is technical innovation. And this is, this is the most well-known type of innovation. But it's also, in terms of the definition, as I said, linked to new processes and operational techniques, it, it speaks of being able to do that internally. And that's why I like putting that first. Because innovation is not just something you, you can take to your external market. Innovation is something you can take to your internal market. You can look at new and different ways of doing a process better, a framework, perhaps a product definition, being able to work with the technology aspect to combine the business quite interesting because not a lot of people think of distribution as an innovation. And to give you an example, um, if you look at McDonald's, okay, McDonald's make hamburgers, all right? But one of the big successes of the past 50, 60 years is the fact that you can get a McDonald's hamburger by driving through, all right? And all they've done there, which was very innovative, is say, you don't have to get out of your car, all right? You can drive through, get your hamburger and go off. Why was that innovative? Because society was changing. When McDonald's was founded in the 50s, all right, there was a bit of a slower pace of life. People would go out to a restaurant, have a meal. All right, today, it's, it's very difficult to do that, but it's very easy to stop and grab something on the way home, all right? And remember what I said earlier about innovations being copied, all right? At this moment in time, everyone's got to drive through in that particular industry, KFC, Nando's. I mean, I, I quite like it when you, you drive up through Midrand and there's a Shisa Nyama with a, with a, with a drive-through. 
<laughs> just as you go by off the freeway underneath on your way into town. Um, for my sins, I, I deal with people like Neotel and uh, and Bytes and Vodacom, and they're all around Midrand, so I get to know where all the Shisa and Yamas are. Um, and then finally, innovation, what is what, what most people think of innovation, which is service and product innovation. Okay, and, and that's directly linked to the formation of new, and I've put in brackets there, or altered products or services. And once again, as I said to you earlier, all right, division is an innovation process. Okay, and to give you an example, um, Altex got 44, or Altron has 44 group companies, and one of those group companies is a company called Altec Matomo, which is basically Altec Radio Holdings. And um, kind of like you know, video killed the radio star. Uh, when cellular telephony came around, everyone turned around and said, "Well, why the heck would we ever need radio communication?" And that's a very, very good question. Why would we if we had cell phones? Well, the funny thing is, is if a cell phone network goes down, everything goes down, but your radio network's still up. And by dividing from our product offering, we were able to create a niche market specifically to emergency services and police. All right, so that in, you know, we've seen it in the States when there's a terror attack, one of the things they do is they do a network. But emergency services need to communicate somehow. All right, and that was our way of being innovative and taking an existing company subtracting from it its usual market or its traditional market and finding a new market and then saying, okay, fine, how can we build processes, services around this new product? And El Comitomo is still going strong based on the fact that we were able to do that. So areas of innovation, the most important thing is to look at different ways of finding value. Value creation in your organization, value creation to your customers. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to just cover is, is types of innovation. So I've, I looked at what is known as disruptive theory, there, disruption theory. And one of the things that disruption theory states is, is that what we need to do in order to be innovative is bring something which disrupts the market. If you are able to disrupt the market, you are able to get what they call rents, but bigger profits, and you're able to, to, to bring a better mousetrap to the market, so to speak. And there are four types of innovation that could shape a market. The first is, is low-end disruptive, okay, and that's very, very basically a dramatically cheaper way of producing worse products um, for customers who are overserved by existing products. And that may sound like a very odd thing to say, right? I'm going to like, give you this example. So if you look at um, the example of telecommunications networks in Africa, uh, as I said, one of, the, one of the really good parts about my job is they send me to Nigeria every now and again. It's really cool. Um, and there are approximately 144 million people in Nigeria. Um, there are about four or five networks servicing them. And like here in Johannesburg, and I say that tongue in cheek, the call quality is, is often not as, not as it should be. All right. And there was one of the um, Nigerian mobile providers who were finding that because their call quality wasn't as good as their competitors, they were obviously um, seeing a lot of churn, a lot of people leaving the network. All right. So their idea was, okay, look, we've got a, a new market. Oh, by the way, most um, cellular network markets in Africa are at least 95% prepaid. All right, so it's 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 it price is 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 of the essence. So what these guys did is say, you know what, um, the biggest cost for me is maintaining and building a new network, and especially in a country like Nigeria, which you know has a couple of issues and, and there are various factions fighting sometimes. Um, and they said, you know what, we're going to we're just going to decouple that cost from our service offering. And what they did was they made their calls free. So if you're on the network, all right, you buy their SIM card, stick it in. Calls are free. All right, you can make free calls to your friends. If it gets dropped, you can't really phone customer service and complain about a free service, can you? <laughs> all right. But here's the thing: they made their money out of people who keep their SIM card in, and other people phone them. Okay. So now that makes sense. That was disruptive in the market by being able to give free calls, really bad service, but free calls. 
Okay? And then saying, this is how I'm creating a new value curve for myself. Um, the next example is new market disruptive. So this is just basically a cheaper, more accessible way or worse performing products that turns non-consumers into customers. Once again, cellular, okay, prepaid. This is just really about going to market and saying, all right, someone's charging you one rand fifty, I'll charge you one rand per, per, per minute or, or whatever. So it's just saying, you know, it, it's, it's just cutting the cost to the consumer. The next thing, which is what we all look for, is what is what are known as quality sustaining disruptions. Now, there was a chap called Clayton Christensen, and, and for those of you who don't know who Clayton Christensen is, um, I'd suggest you have a look at his book. It's, it's, it's called The Innovator's Dilemma. Okay? And Christensen studied a number of markets, and, and he was actually one of the first guys to come up with this idea, this paradigm, that innovations don't last very long, and people copy them. And one of the, one of the areas, one of the businesses that he studied was the storage drive, computer storage drive industry. Okay, and according to um, the ability, you know, uh, computers get quicker, all right, and storage also was able to double quickly. And he, he studied anything from a floppy disk right to, to, to the hard disk, all right, and noted how the capacity got bigger and each one would come to the market with a, with a, with a quality sustaining um, innovation. Um, the problem is, is that sometimes these quality sustaining innovations are done in the wrong technologies. I mean, no one ever uses uh, disk drives anymore. I mean, you carry things around like a, a flash stick and maybe in the future we'll have an implant or something like that. But Christensen said that the way to get the most profit out of a market disruptive innovation is to look at your incremental improvements to your product or service performance, all right? Sometimes they lead to high costs, all right? But what they can do is go out to market and make a big impact. And the best example I can think of this is, is right in the first slide I showed, one of the companies I worked for was a company called Geo, Geo Networks in London. All right, and um, we dealt with, t with communications. And whew, way back in 2004, we came up with the idea that, that businesses would really like to use fiber optics to communicate, okay? And that wasn't the, the, the market disruptive innovation. The market disruptive innovation was how we built the network, which was 15 meters below the ground in the sewers of London. All right. Now, for those of you who've actually been into the sewers of London, and I have twice, okay, um, it, 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 it's extremely innovative because most people in London, when they build a fiber optic network, they do a cross cut into a pavement, okay, and the most it goes is six inches. Some people build in the road, but the problem in, in London is that the road, the pavement is always being dug up, okay, they're laying gas pipes, they're looking for... Uh, Victorian relics or even older, they're, they're laying new cables. And that caused disruption to telecommunication networks. And I'm glad we're actually in, 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 in Santon because the, our biggest customer base was actually the financial industry, people who were doing what's known as algorithmic trading. They needed to be able to, to communicate very, very quickly to stock markets. All right, They needed to be first in the stock market and they needed minimal disruption. All right, And that was a very, very good quality sustaining. Why? Because we were more expensive. Okay, and we, and we blatantly said we're more expensive. But the quality of the product was such that people were compelled to use it. All right? And when people think of innovation, this is the type of, 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 of market disruptive innovation that they think of and mostly aim for. Um, and if anyone sees me outside, sometimes at these things there are, there are finger dinners and stuff like that. And every time I went on a tour of the London sewers, they would serve a finger dinner afterwards. Just, <laughs> no, I'm being serious. It's just, it's not that appetizing. I kid you not, it's not that appetizing. It's like, oh great, we got little sausages. No, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Um, and the final one, which I've put down here, is probably the one that you guys, um, as business analysts, are most interested in, which is efficiency sustaining um, innovation, okay, market disruptive innovation. And that is basically an incremental innovation that makes a product cheaper or a business more, ineffic more efficient. And I know for one at Eltec Isis, we're always pushing optimization and efficiency and looking at is there a better way to implement this product, this service? Okay, is there a better way to take it to market, um, whether it be internally within the customer or externally? Okay, and, and these are important all the time, but particularly important when product performance becomes only good enough for customers. Okay, 
and customers want something else. And examples we see, if, if you look at the iPhone 5C, um, you know, Apple pushed the envelope to the iPhone 4, the iPhone 5, and now customers are saying, you know what, it's kind of nice, but it's old hat. How do we keep up with Samsung? Hence, they came up with 5C, all right, which are different colors, different designs, slight changes to the operating system. But the point of that is, is it's an incremental innovation. And this is the type of innovation that I would imagine that 90% of us, or maybe 75% of us in the room today, work on on a daily basis and is our bread and butter. Okay? And, and, and as I said, it, it is within a market or, or a market disruptive type of innovation if you're looking at just increasing the increment of what you're doing and making it better. It's not going to blow anyone away, but it is going to keep you at the forefront of that curve. Um, the one thing I did want to just end this particular section off on is by saying that change does not equal innovation. A lot of people come and say, hey, we've got a new process, it's changed, it's wonderful. But as I put in, in my tweet over here, is that there is an abundance of change in the business world. But we have to, as business people and as analysts, effectively translate this to innovation in both methodology and processes. And there is an old German saying, which I don't quite no German, which my fiance is German, okay, which is which is quite interesting because I'm obviously half British, half South African. But uh, if we ever have children, they'll be quite schizophrenic. Um, and the German saying says this is that change is good, okay, but not change for change's sake. All right, and we have to be able to say if we're getting these incremental improvements, if we're changing the way we do something, how do we translate that to a process and a methodology? Okay, and and that's the point of of the next section, which is saying how do we take the innovation that we're working on on a daily basis, in some instances, on a weekly basis, um, or that you know million dollar bright flash idea, and turn it into a process. Okay, and, and this hopefully is, is, is the crux of, of what I'm trying to say because if we can capture that thought fox, that innovation, and repeat it, it'll make not only ourselves stronger, our company stronger, but our society and economy stronger. Okay, and as I said, it's, it's not about a once-off. It's not about just a few new products, a few new ways of doing things. Okay, it's about looking at a company and changing the company-wide approach and ethos towards innovation. I have a saying, and my saying is innovation without a process is luck. All right? If you come up with something and it works well, and you don't know how you came up with it, but it works, it's kind of lucky. It was like me getting here tonight. I kind of went by a Bryanston and took a lift at Rudaput and didn't quite know how I got here, but I got here. It was a very innovative way of getting here, but ultimately it was luck. Okay? But Let's look, at, let's look at determining a process. Now, this is where I start looking at ourselves at LTech, okay? Um, and looking at ways in which we deal with innovation. And if this keeps still, I'll quickly have a sip of something. And what we look at doing is, it's, 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 it's very simple, it's threefold. Okay, and the first thing we do is, we, we create a foundation for innovation, all right? So, we look at ways of developing a culture of innovation. I'm actually quite lucky that's not alcoholic because this kind of shakes and then I might fall off. Um, <laughs> the first thing we do is, is look at developing a, a culture of innovation is everything that we do. Okay, and, and that starts with management. That starts with the idea that we need to innovate in order to survive, in, in order to, 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 to optimize our processes to become more efficient. Okay? And we have to embed it in our strategy and say, this is something that we do. We are innovative and this is how we're going to do it. Okay. Um, we also have to come up, well, that's the innovation intent, but with the identification of what is a good innovation or idea, well, it starts off as an idea, okay, and stimulate the creativity process. And then we have to look at ways of, of harvesting ideas. Okay, it's, it's, it's no use that, you know, Joe Bloggs in the mailroom or, or Sipo Kumale comes up with an idea, but it's, it's, it's not acted upon. We have to harvest those ideas. And then finally implement it, because if we don't implement it, that's, that's no, no, no use to us. But as I said, we have to create the foundation of innovation. That's the first step. The second step, and this is extremely important, is have a reason to innovate. Okay? It's, it's self-evident. It's a self-evident truth. All right? Don't innovate for innovation's sake. Don't change for change's sake. All right? And most of the time, probably 95% of the time, the reason you innovate is for your customer. Okay? Your internal and your external customer. 
Okay, and that's how that's what should be at the middle of this of this process that I'm I'm trying to define. Okay, and if we look at ways of how do we improve our delivery, our process to the customer, then that is your prime reason to innovate, or should be at any rate. And then finally, what we look to do is create an autopoetic innovation process. All right, once again, a lot of maths and science people, autopoetic is just a fancy way of saying self-sustaining. Okay, and the reason I like that is because it can't be a once-off. The wheel mustn't just turn, and then we pat ourselves on the back and walk away and say, well done. We have to create a self-sustaining process that keeps on churning out this innovation so that we can stay ahead of the value curve. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to be able to create the self-sustaining process and embed it across our organizations. All right, so how do we do these three things? Well, the first thing is we look at innovation intent. All right, um, transforming a company is, is not an easy thing to do. Okay, it creates a dedicated process for nurturing and, and commercializing valuable ideas. But often, and, and I find this in, in our organization a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you guys too, especially organizations which are listed on the stock exchange, you're faced with two different paradigms. Okay, you're faced with your, your, your line managers, your bosses saying to you, okay, great, we want to deliver real-time results um, because we have to report our results for quarterly basis and we have to achieve our targets monthly, yearly, etc. But by the way, could you also look into the future and prepare for perpetual results and perpetual innovation year after year? So it creates, it, in order to have this intent, you need kind of a dualistic mindset, okay? Um, and that is to look at today, how am I going to make it better today, but how am I going to make it better in the next five, ten years? to create meaningful and lasting change or innovation within the organization. And the first step in, in, in getting that is looking at what we need to do within the organization to overcome the lack of innovation. And I've kind of put five things here that, that we've identified. And the first thing is an absence of a required mindset to harvest and manage ideas. Um, as you said, Sony had the idea to build the first iPod, but didn't commercialize it. Obviously, Kodak is another example, okay, in terms of the, the digital photography. Um, because of internal battles, and, and you know, there's, there's a phrase for it, internal politics sometimes, okay, we can't harvest the right ideas at the right time, okay? And that's something that we have to overcome as organizations, especially in Africa. Um, the lack or misalignment of resources available for investment and innovation. So obviously if there's duplication, that leads to inefficiencies and waste. But the challenge is, 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 is not that an organization has insufficient resources to invest in innovation. The challenge lies where to most effectively funnel those resources and use it. And a couple of examples I'll, I'll give you. And you know, one of the things about working in Africa that I've discovered is everyone's a generalist. Okay, and I'm sure you're all going to nod when I say this, but you know, you're all tasked with doing about 10, 15 different things on a daily basis. All right? And sometimes we lack that focus on what we're doing because we're trying to juggle so many different balls that it becomes difficult to say, okay, I'm channeling our resources, our knowledge workers, okay, creating a community of practice and channeling it in this direction for the betterment of my client, of my company, okay? And, and that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we face, especially in, in, in this country, in this continent. Um, the next thing is, is human capital assets which are underutilized and disengaged. And as business analysts, we're all knowledge workers, okay? And that's where the majority of innovation comes from, knowledge workers, okay? People who understand the bigger picture. People who understand the bigger picture, you understand the processes and frameworks that make the bigger picture up and how to manipulate it in order to produce innovations. And sometimes we see resources that are underutilized, not utilized in the correct way, all right, and also not and also disengaged from the organization. And, and that is probably the most critical part of this, because that knowledge worker who sees the bigger picture but knows the, the granularity isn't able to, to translate those innovations. And the knowledge which is implicit in each and every one of us, okay, isn't able to, to, to translate to being explicit knowledge and explicit innovation. The fourth thing is broad product and 
delivery capabilities. Once again, we're all doing a hundred things at once, okay? And we're looking at a broad sphere, which is fantastic. If you're Leonardo da Vinci and you can dissect someone and then tomorrow invent the helicopter, fantastic, okay? But most of us aren't, okay? You know, and, and because we're looking or we're challenged with such a vast array of tasks and jobs, we find it difficult to what I call focusing on a particular value curve creation, okay? And a value curve creation, just to give you an example, um, a value curve is looking at your business and saying, this is the value, or your department, this is the value that I bring to my customers, okay? And I'm going to shape my value curve that I'm particularly good at these areas. And to give you a real world example, if we look at the um, business hotel, business travel, all right? Um, you know, a hotel's a hotel's a hotel. You want room service, you want a great lobby, you want air conditioning, you want a comfortable room. But you know what? When a core hotels in the early 90s looked at that, they said, oh no, if I'm addressing business travelers, they don't really care about having a big lobby. All right? They don't really care about having maitre d' or sommelier service. What they care about is that they're going to have a good night's sleep, it's value for money, it's hygienic, and it's convenient. That's it. So what they did was the value curve in the hospitality industry also included things like room service, like the quality of food, etc. But they concentrated on those four things, all right? And they came up with a range of budget, business-friendly hotels, all right? And if we look in the last 10, 15 years, you get things like Holiday and Garden Court, which have copied them, Formula One, which have copied them, and a number of other chains, which now offer the business traveler a budget hotel, which kind of hits their value curve. And that is the one thing that we have to do. If we're looking too broadly in the organization, we're not going to understand where to be innovative within our particular value curve. Okay? And the last thing I've, I've said in terms of removing a barrier is having is basically not having a strategy. Okay? I said the lack of holistic innovation strategy. And, and this is, I mean, the innovation paradox is, is that although we need to innovate just to survive, as I pointed out previously, most of the time we focus on operational issues. All right? Not many people in this room, I would imagine, said, you know what, today I'm going to take 25% of my time to come up with something new. Okay? You're mostly probably putting out fires. Okay? I know I was. Okay? And, 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 and running hither and thither and doing things. And again, I find that this is a particular challenge here in Africa because of the fact that we have a deficiency of knowledge workers, okay? And we sometimes have to overcome it, by, and we think the way to overcome it is by putting in extra hours in operational issues. But that operational focus dampens our innovation pro focus. And as Einstein said, he said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I tried this in a trick, it didn't work with my teachers, all right? According to them, they said knowledge is more important than imagination, but you know, if Einstein says it, then I shouldn't bet it. But the point of this, okay, is that if we look at, once again, you know, I mentioned that innovation triad, North America, Europe, Japan. Okay, the Japanese believe there are four types of managerial time, and for managerial, we can substitute knowledge worker time if we really want. And they believe, yes, there is operational time. Okay? That's the time spent correcting yesterday's errors. But there's also strategic time, the time to plan for the future, all right? There's innovative time, the time to become more competitive tomorrow. Okay? As I said right in the beginning, it's about changing, adapting, okay? And then finally, what they call Kaizen time, the time for continuous improvement. Obviously, some of the companies like Sharp that I put up, they didn't adhere to this, but this is a fantastic blueprint um, for us to come up with what I call creativity collision points. Okay, and a creativity collision point is the ability to stimulate ideas, sometimes two totally different ideas, to come up with something new, all right, within an organization. And history is littered with this. Okay, Gutenberg, okay, who invented the printing press, all right, his day job, does anyone know it? He repaired wine presses. So he was a bit of an alcoholic. Most people would say he was a Cape Townian. No, he wasn't from Cape Town. He was from Germany. Um, but with all the Germans in Cape Town, you might as well be in Germany. Um, so Gutenberg had a knowledge of wine presses, but he also had a passion for books and being able to extend knowledge. He combined the two in a creativity collision point, came up with the printing press. Steve Jobs, all right? He obviously knew about computers. They built apples in the early 80s. 
from the garage. But he also had an interest in form as well as function, in design, and then married the two, came up with a new paradigm. And we need to stimulate these creativity collision points if we are to be more innovative and if we are to be more innovative internally within your company, within your department. But why do we need to innovate? All right, why is it so, why is everyone talking about it? Why is everyone pushing this agenda? Well, okay, in, in 1997, Harvard Business Review conducted a multinational, multi-industry study. Okay, and although it was 97, and, and that was over 15 years ago, um, it still has validity today. And, and the study was called Value Innovation, the Strategic Logic of High Growth. And what they found, okay, because they were, they were trying to pin down innovation and say, what is it that makes companies innovative? All right, what is this Alexa, this, this, this magic formula, this alchemy? And what they found was that company structure absolutely didn't matter. Okay, you could be a startup, a sole trader, a multinational corporation. It didn't matter. Okay, you've all got an equal shot innovation. Sector, it didn't matter either. Okay, some people said, oh, but we're in the technology sector. We are the most innovative. Sure, but, you know, you can get bogged down in, in process. And, and you can, you know, not look at telecom. <laughs> They're in the technology sector. Okay, so sector didn't matter. Um, but what did matter was an innovation strategy. Okay, the ability, as I said right at the beginning, that an organisation possesses and say, we are going to be innovative, end to end. We're going to be innovative, end to end in our company, end to end in our department, end to end in our area. Okay. And value innovation basically had five different areas. Okay, the industry assumptions, how that company approached its industry, all right, as well as things like benchmarking and making sure against competitors that they were being innovative, all right. Strategic focus, so being able to say, how are we strategically going to alter that value curve? Okay, customers, why? Because the customer is your reason for innovating, I hope. Okay. Assets and capabilities, so to say these are the assets we have, these are the capabilities we have within the organization, and this is how we're going to deploy them to stimulate innovation. And then finally, it's product and service offerings, and, and I put that last because that's the output of what you're looking at, the product and service offerings to your clients. And that was the most important thing that, that this Harvard Business Review study found. found, found. Um, and ultimately they concluded, and this shouldn't really be a surprise, is that innovation leads to high profit. And that's why everyone's chasing it, all right? Because it leads to high profit, all right? And this was proven empirically. In that year, what they did was they looked at the incremental improvements, okay, line extensions of new products, new services, etc. They found that this made up to 86% of all launches, accounted for 62% of all revenues. Why? Because they had a bigger base, they had an established uh, market, and finally made up 39% of all profits. But here's the kicker. When they looked at what they called value innovation launches, all right, disruptive market improvement, the type I, I outlined a couple of slides ago, they found that these only made up 14% of all new launches. It only accounted for 38% of revenues in that year, but made up 61% of all profits. And that's why everyone pushes innovation, because it is highly profitable to do so. Okay, we've established the case for innovation, we know what it is. So now, how do we capture it? How do we create this autopoetic innovation process? Well, in terms of that, there are a couple of things you can do. And the most important thing is obviously start with people, okay? Create an environment for innovation amongst knowledge workers. Okay, once again, because knowledge workers see the bigger picture, plus you understand the processes, the frameworks, and the granularity of what you're doing. And you're able to marry that and understand and it and get outputs. Secondly, have a vision. Empower your staff. Don't let them be disengaged from the process. Okay? Have a vision and an aspiration to be innovative. Thirdly, drive it from the top down. Okay? From management level. If your management aren't going to be innovative, your 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 work on the factory floor certainly isn't going to be. Okay? The next thing is idea harvesting. So no Know your market. Know what types of value curve you're trying to create. Know what types of innovation you're looking at. And harvest ideas around that. Okay? If you make biscuits, probably not a good idea to try and harvest ideas on, on, on how to create a new drive. 
Okay, but look at areas that you want to, to, to innovate. The next thing is commercialization skills. Ensure that your company has the skills and the process to take an idea, run it through the process, and come out with something that's commercial at the end of it. Um, I mean, if, look, hey, if you don't want to do that, you, you, know, you might probably get fired because that's your reason for being sometimes. But that is a key skill. The next thing is benchmark. Okay? Benchmark within your sector and your competitors. And by benchmarking, I don't mean copy them. All right? I mean, you can copy them. But if you say, fine, my competitors and my sector come up with 20 value innovations a year. Therefore, I want to do 25. Or maybe in your particular sector, there are only one or two. Then fine, look at one or two. But benchmark, know what your sector demands. All right? Document and publicize the process. Uh, once again, this is to make sure that it's not an isolated event. There is end-to-end is -end management. And it's available to all staff. As I said earlier, one of the successes um, at Altec Isis is we have a number of knowledge workers who have implicit, value, implicit knowledge, all right? And this knowledge is tied up in their head, all right? And, and I've got two of my colleagues here, Margie and Martin, all right? And uh, uh, what we try and do is we, sorry, do you guys want to put up your hand? So they, they know, it's those two. So if you want to talk to them afterwards and, and ask them, you, you, you can. But what we try and do is we try and link teams of people who have a lot of experience, a lot of implicit knowledge, and then link them with, 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 with university graduates, people who are coming online into the business analyst process, and enable them to, to harvest that implicit knowledge and turn it into something explicit where we can add value to the customer. Okay? And finally, institutionalize innovation. All right? um, interestingly enough, institutionalizing innovation is not merely about having the biggest R&D budget. Apple is, is, has been, for the last couple of years, been voted as the most innovative company in the world, but it, it certainly hasn't got the top 25 biggest innovation budget. All right? It's in the top 100, but it isn't the biggest. So you know, if you look at driving innovation, you'll be more successful than just throwing money at it. Fine. Very, very simple. This is what it looks like. We create a foundation for innovation. It has got a symbiotic arrangement. It has got a symbiotic relationship with the innovation process. But both are focused at the customer, be it internal or external. And that is basically the top level of, of, of what we do in order to, to come up with innovation within LTEC ISIS. And very quickly, before I move off defining the process and, and, and developing it, um, I just wanted to look at probably what is one of the most innovative industries, and that's the pizza industry. Okay? And a pizza is a pizza, a pizza. I mean, you can change a couple of ingredients. But especially if you've been to, to Europe or North America, you'll find about sometimes two or three pizza places on the same street. Okay? And these guys are very innovative in terms of their marketing and how they go to market strategy, because if they're not, they don't survive. Okay, and I've just looked at a couple of innovations that they've come up with, which hopefully you'll find quite interesting. But this is the first one here is from a pizza company in Dubai. All right, for those of you who can't read, that says "Push for Hunger." All right, and what that basically is is it's 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 on a little box that you put in a fridge magnet, and you come home, you're hungry, you want something to eat, and you flip that up and you push it. And you know what? Because you're pre-registered. You just get a message coming back saying, oh, hello, Mr. Smith. Are you having your usual, your four seasons, or are you having a meat salami thing, or are you having a new one, you know, whatever your, your choice is? And it gets dispatched. All right, so, you know, the pizza company that comes up with that gets a lot of um, impulsive business, so to speak. The next thing is, um, is delivery, okay? That's a drone, okay, normally associated with the Iraq war or somewhere in Afghanistan or something like that. But they've looked at ways of expanding their market share, okay, and say, great, we don't want to just deliver to people in the inner city, but how do we deliver to people in more far-flung areas? And one of the things they came up with was using drone technology to deliver it. Um, the next one is, 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 is a Domino's app. So what that is is if you're hungry, you press Domino's, and it, it basically guides you via GPS to your nearest Domino's. It literally says, walk 100 meters, turn right, then go left for another kilometer. Okay, um, This one I, I, I kind of liked too, which is it's advertising on ATMs. But the real kicker is, which you can't see in the picture, is the pizza shops here. So they're hoping that you know people go there to draw money. <laughs> Says, hey, do you want a pizza? Oh, here we are, Pizza Hut next door. Okay, 
and my personal favorite in terms of, of being innovative in, in the pizza industry is, is this one. Now what this is, is it's basically a DVD disc that you can rent from a video shop and it's got heat activated ink. So you, you put your DVD in, you watch your movie, when you take it out, the ink has been activated by the heat and it looks like, and wait for this, smells like a pizza. Okay, being innovative in an industry which produces pretty much the same thing. Okay, and, and yeah, I thought we'd just cover that. So my final section is, is drilling it down, okay, and saying, sure, that's from an external perspective, but how can we be innovative internally? And what I've done is I've, I've looked close to home, which is, which is our company, LT ISIS, and said, I mean, just from a, an ISIS perspective, we have a number of business analysts. Okay, we've got a team of about over 60. Um, and, and one of the successes, we work in a matrix structure. So your architect sits with your developer, who sits with your BA, who will sit with your tester, your QA person, um, your project manager. Okay, so each can feed off those explicit, the explicit knowledge and ideas, and the ideas shared throughout the, the delivery chain. Okay, um, and obviously what we do is focus on what the business wants. We, we, we obviously have the frameworks like CMI, TM Forum, Certified, etc. But if I look at our pool of, of, of BA resources, okay, what makes us successful, and I've kind of modeled this on, on the ideas before that I presented in terms of creating an autopoetic um, process. Uh, and what makes us successful is number one, our people, okay. Um, look, we, no matter how we slice and dice it, there are skill shortages in, in the BA environment and we've had to look at very at innovative ways of creating and or mentoring business analysts. And it's very difficult to go to university and just say, hey, you know, any BA is coming through and we're going to the market, it's expensive, time consuming, you can hardly find these people. So what we try and do is we have a number of um, sponsorship and bursary programs at various universities in South Africa, but we also look for a certain mindset okay, in the business analyst. And one of the things which, which we concentrate on are systems engineers because we find that that is a particular mindset. Martin over there, Martin, you came out of Stellenbosch, what, about three years ago? What did you study? Industrial. industrial. So industrial and systems engineering, okay, because of that mindset. So Martin's been with us for about three years. Um, am I right? And he was employee of the year at our function last week, by the way, so congratulations later. Um, now he's turning a brighter shade of red. <laughs> It's a nice red handbag you have next to you, Margie. I can contrast it. Um, but one of the things we do is we start off with the people and we look at the kind of people who will fit our methodology and also be more innovative. The people who are, who are geared towards that way of thinking, if I may put it like that. The second thing we look at is process, okay? So we make sure that we have a process which is determined to not only deliver innovation within LTEC ISIS, but also within the customers that we service. Okay. In many instances, we, we also take entire departments of BAs and, and get it outsourced to ourselves. So we have to become innovative um, and more efficient within that particular department. The next thing we do is of practice. Okay. So in, in, I, I, one of the things I, I, I have to look at as part of my job is something called big data which is this idea that data is all around us and how do we harvest information from it. And in big data, the best way you can do that is, is what is known as the four Vs. So you look at the velocity of the data, the volume, the variety, and the veracity. So what that means is you look at, at the full amount of the data, um, the variety, data from different sources, okay, the veracity, the truthfulness, um, uh, and, and basically put all those together and create a diversified input to give you the correct answer. And that's what we're kind of doing there, where we create a community of practice with diversified skill levels and diversified skills so that you can cross-pollinate and work together. So I know Margie and Martin, for example, are kind of in a community of practice because they're working at one of our clients over here. Okay, and they have different skills, different skill levels within the team. The next thing we do is look at knowledge transfer and management. Okay, once again, getting that implicit knowledge out is, is quite a challenge um, in, in, the, in the business analysis arena. And we make sure that this is easily shared 
okay, and easily accessible within repositories. But not just within repository for our company, but also in various departments, and especially in client engagements that we have, in order to share that knowledge that we create for them. Because a lot of business these days is intellectual property, IP driven, and they want to capture that essence, all right? So, so that's a, another thing which has been quite successful, is capturing the essence Okay, uh, they're working in terms of the customer grouping market sector, all right, and marrying those three we find is, is, is quite a success factor. Um, the next thing is, is output driven outcomes. Okay, our projects are driven not by time, but by an outcome. We have to get it FAT before we get paid, and, and that has a very, very explicit way of focusing the mind. Okay, so it, it, it's not. Yes, it is the activity because it's process driven, but not activity for activity's sake. It's can we get the outcome that we desire? All right, and, and that's what that's what drives us. Um, and sometimes it drives us mad, <laughs> especially when customers are demanding certain things. Um, and then finally, an economy of scale. And when when I did the study for our organization, this was this was actually the weirdest thing to come out of this. Okay, is the economy of scale. And let me explain. Um, how do you achieve an economy of scale with, with business analysts? Well, very, very simply, if we look at the way the teams are structured as a managed service, okay, we have found that if we take a team of five people and if they were to work individually, let's say they can do three projects, so that's 15. But we found that if we take a team of five people with the correct skill set, create the correct community of practice, instead of delivering 15 projects in a certain time, they can deliver 25. Okay? And the reason that they can do that is because they have a diverse knowledge set. You're not relying just on the knowledge of the one person working on it. Okay? So if I look at that internally within organizations, try and work with different people at different levels of different knowledge groups. The next thing it has is, is that, and this is, this is actually quite interesting because it's a human factor. All right? Business analysts are people. I know, it's just a rumor. I normally pause at that point. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and all people have aspirations and human needs and desires, and then what you want is you want your career path, you want to grow, you want to look at different things. Okay, and, and one of the reasons when we studied it that we found people were leaving our organization was to grow, all right? And if we looked at taking specific analysts and putting them on specific areas only, we found that they didn't get that career growth, all right? But if we took a pool of different projects and got them to look at a vast number. They got intellectual growth, they got career growth, and they would stay. And that has a follow-on two ways. Number one, we have lower resourcing costs, all right? Number two, we can take those lower resourcing costs and pass it on to, to the end customer, as I said, whether it's internal or external. And ultimately, it creates a self-sustaining pool of experienced knowledge workers, of experienced business analysts who can deliver better and deliver more. And as I said, that was the most interesting thing to come out of, of what I was tasked to do in terms of looking at, at why it works. So those are techniques. Let's look at an example of, of, of how we've applied this. All right? so, and one of our biggest customers is Vodacom. All right? And at Vodacom, um, they had very familiar challenges. And, and, and I see these challenges throughout, um, throughout the industry where you know, they have a lack of staffing or they find it difficult to, to keep their staff, keep them trained, uh, there's lack of innovation, functionality, and their budgets get depressed year after year, which is kind of like everyone. They also had quality standards and control issues, um, as well as they interfaced, they had to work with about 50 systems at Vodacom and a number of different projects. So, so they were finding that the, the, the pool that they had wasn't able to keep up with the changing um, products and processes. Okay, so what we did is we came in and said, okay, we're going to deploy our model within Billing Services Group of Vodacom on a total outsource solution. Um, and what we did there was basically the, the five points that I mentioned earlier. We we resourced the model, okay, across all functions in the organisation. So in Billing Services, and I'm just when I say all functions of the organisation, this is just a specific area of a customer. Okay, so we're not looking across the entire. Vodacom organization, just within billing and services. 
All right. We facilitated intellectual property as well as development. Okay, and, and, and that was that was that's always a challenge. It's who owns the, the intellectual property. All right. And how do we facilitate development? And and one of my favorite parts of my job is, is dealing with lawyers. So if there are any lawyers, <laughs> I'll see you near the edge later. Um, <laughs> And we set up the correct reporting interfacing mechanisms. That's that's also Okay, send a gift to someone. All right, so we, we, we have to get that up and running within three months flat in time for Christmas. Okay, um, and my personal favorite is. was that the customer made savings year on year on their CPI adjusted budget. Once again, it was that economy of scale. I know it sounds weird to apply it in, in this context, but the ability that we had low staff turnover, that staff could work on a variety of different projects, and we could deliver on more. Okay, um, And obviously, faster and more innovative go-to-market product life cycle. So the, the things I've kind of just explained to you. And that was their main innovation push. It's, we want an idea, society's changing, our customers change, our competitors change. How do we change quicker than they do? And how can you facilitate that, please? Okay, um, And then finally, you know, they, start, they solved all their organizational issues, particularly on the resourcing, particularly on the, on, on the delivery, um, and particularly on the innovation front. So from our particular perspective, that's how we, that's an example of how we insource innovation, use it within our organization, and applied it to an external customer. But the, the concepts that I've gone Um, what is the future of innovation? And I started off with a quote from Charles Darwin, all right? And I'm going to end off with something that's very similar from a chap called Professor Leon Meganson. Um, and he said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, or the most intelligent, or the strongest. It's the one that's the most adaptive to change. For change, you can read innovation, all right? The one that's the most adaptive and innovative in its go-to-market strategy, how it deploys it, and how you address your customers' needs, okay? And, I mean, just to give you an example of that, if you look, you know, you go back 15, 20 years ago, everyone was talking about Microsoft. Microsoft is the world's biggest company. It's the most innovative. It's going to take over the world. We can't see innovation beyond Microsoft. And then along came Apple. Apple saw value Microsoft didn't. And then... Apple were the market leader, and they were going to take over the world, and they were going to be the future source of all innovation. And then along came Google, and Google saw things that Microsoft and Apple didn't see, ways of, ways of producing value that the other two giants had been studying but hadn't quite gotten done. And now Google are going to take over the world. But then along came Facebook, and Facebook saw value that the others didn't see. And now everyone's saying, Facebook's going to take over the world. And if you talk to any 12-year-old, they probably are. All right, that's, that's, that's a bad thing. But just to, uh, just to end off, innovation is transformative. Oh, shit, wrong one. I hate it when I press the wrong button, especially when I'm building up to a big crescendo. That was I, Before I go there, um, 
I remember I was at school and, and we were doing an oral and, and this one chap, Anton Greenfield, never get, forget his name, he was doing his uh, oral on Coke. And you know when you open a can of Coke, it goes, Shh. All right, and that was his big intro. And of course, you know, you had to go to the tuck shop, you only got one Coke, and I said, okay, teacher said, yep, you can do your oral, and he walked in and went, Coca-Cola. And the teacher said, oh, sorry, Anton, I wasn't concentrating, could you just do that again? <laughs> It's always a good one. So that was my Antoine Greenfield moment. All right. Okay. Innovation is, 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 is transformative. What, what we've found and our finding is that it's always had the ability to change our environments. Okay. But it's becoming faster and faster the innovation currency of the 21st century. And it's being exacerbated, this rate of change, by technology, by society. And we have to harness it and make sure that we get this impetus and we understand it, we contextualize it within our organizations, and finally we align it with people-orientated problems. And if we do that, that will result in success within your organization, and successfully you'll be able to insource that innovation. Now I can end. Thank you. My name is Mark Gillen. <laughs> um, are there any questions? I didn't like leaving you on that slide, so I'm going to go back one. <laughs> Any questions at all? Hmm. Yeah. Um, very similar question to what someone asked me in, in, in Cape Town. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with, with an example from Altec. Okay. Um, Altec has, has uh, identified that intellectual property creation and ownership is a way to create value going forward. And one of the things that, that we've done within, within the group, okay, so that's within all 4,500 employees, is to create a competition to say, submit ideas, and at the end of the year, the person with the best idea gets a quarter of a million rand. Okay, so it's, it's not like submit ideas and we'll send you on a game drive. Okay, it's something quite attractive all right, and the company is hoping that they can get you know a number of ideas that they can move forward. Okay, um, and this this idea of, of a competition is, is not unique to to Altec. Um, it's there is actually a word for it, um, which I, which escapes me right now, but it's it's one of the most popular ways of stimulating those ideas. And then once you get the ideas, you can decide which ones fit within your particular industry and and, and department and sector. Etc. Um, other ways to do it is even if I look at that, you know, concept of kaizen time and innovation time. Set time aside <laughs> that you don't have to put a quarter of a million rounds worth of competition. Okay. Know what sort of ideas you're looking for, and then set time aside. I mean, Bill Gates, when he started out, he would take sometimes three months of a year off, but definitely a month, and he would just go away. He'd go away and think. Okay, he wouldn't have the noise of the day-to-day -day, um, business activities. Okay, and uh, I must admit, when, when I'm doing something, one of the things I'm, I'm doing is, is also a master's dissertation on, on this kind of stuff, so that's why I kind of get academic every now and again. And I, I call it the ability to have clear water, the ability to sit and think, how am I going to do something new? Okay, and most of the time, you're caught up with, with your operations and stuff like that. So you can do simple things like that, like create that, that infrastructure environment for, for clear water thinking. Um, another way you can do it is by creating uh, idea repositories, innovation idea repositories, all right, where people can, can submit it. Or, you know, you can use traditional methods like brainstorming, et, et cetera. But um, the big flagship one at, at, at Altec is that innovation competition throughout the group. Mm. Exactly. And, and once again, that's, that's not a new concept. Google do that all the time. You have to, at Google, take a day or four hours a week or whatever where you work on something totally different. And then, at the end of the quarter, you want to present it to your manager. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, Google's Google's like the poster child of doing that with you know with with innovation. Uh, it's not good news, is it? <laughs> cool. Is there anything else? Hi. Yep. Yes. Um, I, look, it's natural. As I said to you, your your value curve once an, a competitor has identified it doesn't last very long. All right, and people catch up. And it's quite interesting. You you raise banking in South Africa. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I've 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 worked in 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 Europe and America for about ten years. Okay, and um, one of the things about banking that just blows my mind over here is the the, the ability of people to stand in queues. All right, and the big innovation in the last couple of years is to make banking paperless. You look at Capitech. I mean, we sometimes work at the Reserve Bank, and that's a major big drive for them. I mean, they can't be totally paperless, but they want to be as paperless as possible. And what what we've seen is is that a number of, as you say, a bank will say, "I want to be the most innovative," and then there are a whole lot of catch-ups and follow-ons. And interestingly enough, it's actually it's actually related to who's working where. Because you're obviously referring to people like FNB being the most innovative, but if you then look at FNB cut back on staff, as did APSA, and if you just look at the industry, you'll see net banks launching a lot of apps. Because what we've seen is a lot of those staff, and the reason we know this is because we obviously monitor the movement of of knowledge workers, have gone from FNB and APSA to net bank, and we're finding that net banks driving it. Capitech are, are grabbing as many of these people as they possibly can. Um, so from a you know from a South African perspective. It's 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 who's harnessing the skills at that particular time, okay. And very interestingly, FNB, one of the uh, Twitter, the Michael Jordan, when he was the the chairman, CEO, or whatever, he had the biggest Twitter following of any CEO or head of an organization in South Africa, 30,000 followers, which is minuscule by world standards, but it was the biggest in South Africa. And I read a case study about that, and it was actually accident he started on Twitter he got a new feature phone like a new you know Samsung app or whatever and he was playing around with it on a Saturday morning and found and just sent out something and it was obviously at Michael Jordan you're done and someone picked up that this was the guy from FNB and asked him a question and said hey mate you know I keep on going down to my branch in Boxburg and you know why do you only have five tellers on when the weekday you have ten and he's like okay let me look into it okay and um, one of the beautiful things about that was the reason it, 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 it blew out of proportion um, and it expanded so much was because he cared about what he was doing. He wasn't just giving corporate answers. He was he, he cared about it. He gave re, he gave feedback quickly. Okay, marketing didn't know about this until about six months once he was into it, and they read about it on the paper. Okay, and he saw it to fruition, and 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 you know made sure that the problem was solved. Um, so yeah, and then of course now everybody else tries to copy that, but it's really hard to copy sincerity. You know, <laughs> you're, you're either sincere or you're not. But that's that's what we see, you know, as you say, closer to home um, in in South Africa. But you know where I find a lot of innovation these days. And I actually had a question in Cape Town, and he's like, you know, was, was one guy put up his hand and said, you know, how can we in South Africa follow the example of, you know, America or, or China or India, you know, and be innovative? And I said, well, we don't need to, <laughs> to be honest. I find a lot of the best innovations coming out of Africa right now. And a banking example is in Peza, okay, in Kenya. Where most people, everyone has a, a mobile phone, but not everyone has a credit card. But they turn the mobile phone into a credit card. And Pesa doesn't work here in South Africa because you, you can't replicate the market conditions. It doesn't even work in Nigeria, but it's perfect for Kenya and it's very innovative. And that's an example of a of an innovation out of Africa that is incredible that they try to copy the world throughout. Cool. Anyone else? Excellent. No, and 
And thanks for, for raising that, because that backs up my point about how we can all be innovative inside our companies, inside our departments. And it's not just, as you say, that, wow, here's a new product. Okay, and uh, I suppose Steve will be phoning these guys internally now, not on the radio. <laughs> yes? Do you add to it? Do you take away from it? Do you use a different technology platform? It's how. And um, yeah, I mean, you could say it's, he's being more efficient, which is the output, but innovation is the process. And if you can divine how, uh, you know, he'll be the like, number one employee in FNB. You know, and, and, and you know what? Each of you guys are asked this every single day. How many of you guys get asked, what technology should I implement to make my process more efficient and optimize my resources? Okay, and, and that's an example uh, of, of doing that. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, um, I'm going to use the example of Nokia. Okay, and I know Nokia, you know, kind of struggling at the moment, but if we look at Nokia 170 years ago, do you know what they were doing? Forestry, they were cutting trees. That's what they were doing. That's how they started out. They cut trees. You know what the next thing they did? They said, all right. No, yeah, before that, in the value chain. They said, all right, we cut trees. What do you use trees for? You use it for wood. Wait a minute, paper economy is coming up. Let's get mills. And then they got milling business. All right. As the gentleman said, in around about World War One, they saw like you know, apparel, stuff like that. They made boots, and they change all the time. Okay, and everyone's saying, "Oh, Nokia's under pressure," but you know what? From like lumberjacks 170 years ago, that example that I would use. Yeah, just a bit, probably about. <laughs> I remember that, that brief mention of it. Sorry, providing? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think the word bad is, is, is probably incorrect in terms of the context that, that I was looking at. It, I was saying you could take away from your product offering, okay? And the example I used was, was that network in Nigeria which gives free calls, okay? And they couldn't sustain themselves by charging for their service, so they made it free. All right, that sold a lot of different things. Um, but we can also look at, at products. Uh, um, and transistor radios, electronic components, where they said, you've got 100 different buttons, all right? How do we rationalize this to 20? Okay, and one of, one of the innovations that came out of that, which isn't bad by any rate, is the, the Apple button. Steve Jobs wanted one button instead of having 10 or 20, all right? So that's the ability to, to go and say, in this market segment, and we're not all in high growth market segments, you know? Bread is bread is bread, for example. But you know what, I, I used to, uh, as I said, my fiance is German and Germans love bread. They, lo they love like bread and cabbage and stuff like that. It's like a big part of their, their diets in Germany. Um, and you know, I always used to, you know, because she loves these different kinds of bread and I know about sourdough and California rye and green bread and pink bread anyway. Um, and I said to her, you know, when I was growing up in South Africa, we had a great variety of bread. We had government brown and government white, <laughs> all right? Um, and if we, if we wanted to, to get innovative, we'd slice it. That used to be fun. Okay, but now I look at it today. I look at the bread market, you know, and you can get vitamin-enriched white bread. You can get granary bread. You can get bread with, with extra flour or crushed flour or whatever. And that's the way of taking a product which is not necessarily innovative because it's bread and saying, I'm adding to, I'm subtracting. So if you still want to go out and, you know, buy your government white bread, which is at the bottom of the scale, that's fine. But you can also move up or down the value chain. And, and that's what I was trying to say. It's not about giving inherently a bad product. It's about taking a product and making it different, but by taking away from it as opposed to adding to it. 
good. If that's it, then uh, I shall take a seat, and uh, I'm sure we can all mingle. And as I said, I've got some of my team here, so they're, they're trying to hide at this point. But um, if, if you have any questions, just see us outside, I guess. But thank you very much. <laughs>